I was talking to my wife today and an experience weird came up, which we still can't explain. In February 2013, we were dating at the time, we decided to take a weekend trip to a resort on Lake Dalavan in Wisconsin. The weather was cold, but not unusually so, and we thought it would be a neat getaway. To set the stage, the place was pretty much deserted when we arrived. It's mostly a summer attraction for families from Illinois to come on vacation. There's a beach where you can go swimming and also a nearby golf course. People also frequently use the resort for weddings. However, when we were there, there was a thick layer of snow on the resort grounds and the lake was frozen over from months of sub-freezing temperatures. Not even Valentine's Day was enough to attract more than a handful of guests. We checked in and were directed to our room, which was about two thirds of the way down a long deserted hallway. The hallway had a line of rooms on the left side which faced the lake. Walking to the room was kind of eerie because we passed an arcade that was completely deserted and there was no sign of anyone else staying in that wing for the night. The hallway was completely empty and silent. When we arrived at the room, it seemed nice enough and had a pretty view of the frozen over lake. There was one bed adjacent to the wall nearest the bathroom, which was on the right side when you entered the room. We decided to go out and walk on the ice, as my wife was from a warmer climate and had never done so before. When we returned, the first strange thing happened. As I opened the door to our room, I realised I'd left the lights on. However, it abruptly turned off when we entered the room. It looked like one of those lights that has a timer and a motion sensor, so I dismissed it as coincidence. The rest of the evening was pretty uneventful. We went to dinner at the resort restaurants and had a couple of glasses of wine. We were pretty tired, so we ended up going to bed pretty early. I awoke around 3am with an uneasy feeling. The room felt like someone turned the heat off. As I shook off the fogginess of sleep, I noticed a figure standing next to the bed. My hair stood up, and as I tried to make out what it was, a woman with dark hair and a light-coloured dress who was sort of glowing. Before I could make out any more detail, she dissipated. I dismissed this as a dream and eventually drifted back to sleep. About an hour later, I awoke again with the same feeling. She was back, however, this time, I was able to make out more detail. She appeared to be Native American and had braided hair with a light coloured traditional dress. I didn't get the sense she wanted to harm me. She eventually dissipated again without saying anything or really moving. As I laid in bed, paralysed by what I experienced, my wife abruptly sat up. Thinking she was awake, I said, honey, are you up? I've got no response. Her eyes were still closed and she laid back down again. Later, she would tell me that she did not have any memory of doing this. I didn't go to sleep for a long time that night, but also didn't experience anything else. The next morning, we woke up and were laying in bed talking. We hadn't been dating that long at the time, and I was afraid of making her think I was crazy by telling her what happened. Finally, I decided to do it and see if she remembered anything from the night before. As I recounted my story, the lights on the headboard above us flickered on and off. They were turned off at the time, so I found this to be very strange. Later that morning, we went into the bathroom and also noticed that the sink was on full blast. Neither of us recalled even using the sink that morning. We checked out that day and asked the hotel receptionist in passing whether or not the resorts had any reports of being haunted. I expected them to laugh it off, but I instead got a very defensive vibe and denial from them. I later researched the lake and resorts and found out that the grounds were home to Native American burial grounds and were known to be haunted. I had no idea that this was the case before we went. I even found a post discussing how staff reported seeing a woman in a white dress who would wander the halls of the resort. This first happened to me when I was in high school, around six or seven years ago. I had this friend who lived with her dad at a triple X. The entire building was just her and her father and a very old and odd lady that lived on the ground floor. The building was pretty old and not very well maintained, but still decent and comfortable. 
Her dad's bedroom and attached bathroom. An office, dining room, living room and kitchen were on the first floor. The second floor was a bathroom and two bedrooms, which were her sister's. But they both had already moved out. And the last floor was her bedroom. Her dad was a hoarder. Some rooms, like the first floor's office, were just not accessible. But I think his room was the worst. You could walk in it, but I remember that the floor was just covered in coins. It got better as you got to higher floors, and my friend's room was the clearest. Her dad had a stable job, a good job, and he made a good amount of money. He was shy, very discreet. He never talked too much and always in a calm, low voice. He also always moved slowly. Always had that little sad smile and kind eyes. I was friends with her since the second year of middle school and he never tried to learn anything about me. He wasn't close with his daughter neither, but he loved them very much and he was a nice man overall, always welcoming us in his home no matter when. I'm saying was because I haven't seen this friend nor her dad since the end of high school and I don't know what they're up to today. He was always at work or at home and always alone. When he was at home, most of the time he was sitting on the same chair in the living room, watching TV or in his room. When I say most of the time, I mean that when he wasn't making something to eat or sleeping in his room, I never saw him anywhere else in the apartment. And I've been there many times when I knew her because we were kind of close. Also, she always told me that he was pretty different when they first moved here with her sisters. He wasn't a hoarder at the time, much more active and he had a ton of renovation projects for their triplex, which never went all the way. All around the apartment, but mostly in the kitchen, you could see notes on the walls done by him or professionals for renovation works. So one day, I ring her doorbell and her dad opens the door as usual. He just says to me that my friend is in her room and he goes to the kitchen. I cross the living room to go to the stairs and on like the third step, without any reason, I turn my head back. The stairs are open in this floor and you can see the entire living room and open dining room from it. And on her dad's chair, I see a man looking up to me, but like, I don't really see him either. I mean, I remember him perfectly. I could draw him without any hesitation until this day. He was middle-aged, thin, with grizzled hair, and like he hadn't shaved in a few days. I remember his facial features very well, but I don't remember exactly if his beard was also grizzling. He was wearing very simple clothes that could be from any time between the 50s and nowadays. Like a dark blue sweater and thick white, thick white pants. I don't think I saw his shoes though. And also, when I try to remember what that moment when we looked at each other, I remember it as if I saw him in transparency. But it may be because it was very fast. I saw him clear as day. And I didn't even blink and I just didn't saw him anymore. I saw him long enough I could draw him even today. And I noticed his deeply sad expression. Almost supplicating. Supplicating may be a little much, but I can't find another word for it. It was a very strong feeling of overwhelming sadness. But it was like at the same time as I was seeing him, he was already gone. I can't describe it better. I stayed here like one or two seconds and I shrugged it off thinking it was like when you see a shadow in the corner of your eye or I had dreamt it for a second. I must also add that it was a time when my friend, our other friends and I, were high on weed or drunk most of the time, day or night. So I might have thought it had something to do with that. I just got up the stairs, didn't tell her and forgot about it. A few days went by and one morning before high school, she comes to us and tells us that the day before, when her dad was at work, she was watching TV on her dad's chair instead of the sofa as she used to do when, for no reason, she raised her head from the screen to the hallway that led to the entrance and kitchen and in the frame of the hallway there was a man sticking his head as if he was hiding behind the frame looking at her. She added that she wasn't sure she saw him because he immediately wasn't here anymore but she could describe it as clear as day. I instantly remembered the guy I saw and I cut her off briskly describing the guy. She didn't see his pants nor his shoes, but she confirmed everything else, even his sad, supplicating expression. Our other friends weren't as shocked at us too, but she and I talked a lot about it the next few days. 
and she told me that some stuff has been happening for some time, but she never thought it was anything to think about. Like school stuff or a shoe from a pair disappearing for a few days and reappearing in strange places. We always try to rationalise everything, but neither she nor I were totally convinced by the explanations we found. There was always something in our explanations that didn't stick with the rest. And it wasn't long before we both were very scared of a triplex, helped by our imaginations and drinking and smoking habits. A few days later, we skipped the class to go drink somewhere and we bought a cheap bottle of wine. The closest place to find something to open it was her dad's place. He was at work at the time. Her mom lived in the same town as her dad and us, and she was staying less and less at her dad's since we talked about the guy. That day, when she was opening her triplex's door, we were so scared, saying we needed to open the bottle fast and get out immediately. We went in, rushed to the kitchen, found a bottle opener, and when we started opening it, we heard a loud noise from upstairs like a door slamming shut. We froze and then heard loud and quick footsteps coming from upstairs. It could have been her dad, but he was supposed to be at work and it was so out of character. We took the bottle opener and just left running scared for death. Nothing like that ever happened again when I knew her and I don't think anybody had seen the man again at her place. She started to say her dad's more and more as time went by as it was complicated between her and her mom. And the only thing she told me were happening, quite regularly though, were finding her school stuff full of water in her bag, the interior of the bag wet. In the morning, even if she checked it before going to bed, and some shoe disappearing for a few days, and always appearing on the sofa, under a blanket, on the same exact spot. Or at least it's all I remember, and it can be rationalised pretty easily, by possible sleepwalking or stuff like that. But we always believed... It could be something else. We didn't stay friends much longer after all that. And because of stupid teenage drama, I don't have any news from her nor her dad since the end of high school. And I don't know if anything like that has been happening since. The second experience happened to me the year after my high school graduation. I went alone to the other side of the globe to visit my mom. It was the first time I saw her alone since I lived a few years with her in my childhood. She had been living on the streets for some years and just got an apartment. As she didn't own many things, there was just a mattress on the floor where we both slept with no sheets. A desk that was here when she moved in and a plastic garden chair. I stayed there for 10 days and it was horrible for many reasons. Every night I had horrible nightmares. Not only every night, but every time I would fall asleep at her place. Even if I woke up from a nightmare in the middle of the night and went back to sleep. I would have nightmares again, but that can be explained by the stress I was under during my stay with her. But one night, as I was sleeping laying on my side, my back to my mom and her facing the desk and her back to me, I was woken up by what seemed to be around 10 or 20 little hands, smaller than a child's, like three to four centimeters long, all over the front of my body, face, belly, legs, shoulders and arms, but not on my back, nor the back of my legs and arms, nor the back of my head, pulling me towards my mom. I woke up suddenly, sat up and looked around me. Nothing, and my mom was snoring. I had experienced sleep paralysis a few times, so I shrugged it off as being something like that, and I went back to sleep. I don't know if I fell asleep instantly, or if I just closed my eyes, but I immediately felt the hands again. I sat up again quickly and looked around, but still nothing. I was a bit uncomfortable, but I thought it was just a dream. I tried to sleep again, and again I felt the hands pulling me. This time, I woke my mom up and told her what happened three times in what felt like one minute or two. She told me it was the beings in the desk, and that the old lady that left it here had locked them up here. She told me a name for that kind of being, but I don't remember what it was. My mom suffers from schizophrenia, so I shrugged off what she told me. I was expecting that kind of explanation when I woke her up and went back to bed. A little scared, but not enough to fall asleep rapidly after. Nothing like that happened again while I stayed with her, except the vivid nightmares. The last one happened some years ago. I don't remember exactly when, but I think I was in high school or end of middle school. I didn't know much about it, 
but I believed a lot in what I knew about karma and past lives. I had a complicated childhood, and at the time, my only way of explaining why I had to go through so much shit was that I must have done something really bad in a previous life. I was pretty unstable at the time, and one night as I was crying myself to sleep, I thought that I would really want to know if what I thought about my possible past lives was true, and that the best way to have an answer would be to dream about it. So as I was falling asleep and crying, I was supplicating in my head every being that could hear me to send me at least a sign. And I had the strangest dream that night. There was a little girl in an old school dress in a dark room. She looked at me with a heinous look on her face and told me, really, you don't remember? Then we both were in a countryside house. I don't remember the dream exactly, but what I understood is that it was war. She to our looks and the looks of the place. I think World War II in France or England, but I could be wrong. I was a middle-aged bitter lady who never married nor had children. And I don't know if they were family or neighbours, but I had to take of the girl and her big brother. I think their parents were dead or at least missing since some time. They must have been between 8 and 11 years old. And I didn't want nor liked being responsible for them. I fought a lot verbally with the brother. Then there's a scene I clearly remember. I was reluctantly making dinner for us three and they were sitting at the dinner table. I fought with the boy again and he left to go upstairs to his room. I didn't care. A few seconds after we heard sounds that I don't remember, but I left the house running. A girl followed me saying her brother's name that I don't remember is still inside. And when we were a bit away, a bomb fell on the house. I woke up thinking I'd run for my life without thinking one second about choosing two children, not even turning my head to see if the girl was with me. And that was maybe why I had suffered that much as a child myself. I believed it for some time, but as I grew up, I believed in past lives less and less. And there was some inadequacy in that dream, so now I think it was just that, a dream. Even if I find this coincidence pretty odd, but I think I read somewhere that when you think a lot about something, you have more chances to dream about it. So that could also be just that. A small prologue. I'm not particularly sensitive to the paranormal. I know people who are, and sometimes I find myself slightly jealous, but also lucky that I don't have the same gift as they do. I do have a few notable paranormal experiences in my life, mostly because I had to go looking for them. Still, I had many more experiences that were only interesting in that. I don't really truly know if what I was experiencing was paranormal, or it was just my mind playing tricks on me. What I'm about to share is one of the most positively paranormal things I've ever experienced. It was November 11th of last year, Veterans Day in the US, Armistice Day ev elsewhere, the anniversary of the end of World War I. I was driving to work that morning. It was pretty cold and drizzly. I had the radio on, but I was kind of lost in my own thoughts. As I was getting closer to work, I remembered that it was Veterans Day. I consciously took a moment to think about veterans of all our nation's wars, but before I knew it, I was much deeper in thought. That moment of recognition turned into me solemnly imagining what it must have been like on the 11th of November, 1918, on the stereotypically depicted battlefields of World War I. I imagined the confines of wet trenches, the weariness and tenseness that must have been felt at the end of that war. I imagined looking out of a trench upon the infamous no man's land that was barren of all life and vegetation, and how desolate it must have been. I imagine what it must have been like on that exact day, under grey and dreary skies just like today, to hear that the war was over, to hear the guns fall silence, and to look upon the scarred land. I imagine what the re relief must have felt like, but also the awe and sorrow, thinking about all that had been done. Suddenly, I was mentally back in my car and surrounded by the smell of lush and powerfully fragrant flowers. It was incredible. The smell was so strong, it was as if you had walked into a flower store or that the car was just utterly full of flowers. 
I immediately recognised what was happening. I breathed deeply and smiled. I didn't speak, but I mentally gave thanks and acknowledgement to whoever was there. The smell lasted for at most 15 seconds. It was strong and full for at least the first seven seconds as I sniffed deeply some more to try to appreciate it as much as possible. Then the smell began to quickly fade. Just like that, it was gone. I was left with a sense of profound satisfaction, serenity and appreciation. I drive this route to work every day. Never have I ever smelled anything odd, chemical-like or remotely confusing along that stretch of road. Let alone the smell of flowers so strong, it felt as if I was surrounded by them. Keep in mind also that this was a cold November morning. You all know as well as I do that the colder it is outside, the less fragrances you pick up on. I also ruled out my brain confusing this smell with the smell of exhaust or roadkill or anything like that. If I were to drive by a car with a stinky exhaust, that smell seems to linger for entirely too long before my car's ventilation system can cycle it out. The same can be said with the smell of a dead skunk. The smell I experienced was strong, sudden and gone within a very short period of time. I absolutely loved this experience. I don't know if I tapped into something in that moment or that someone from beyond picked up on my recognition, like some kind of radio signal. All I know is that no reasonable or scientific explanation could debunk this experience. It was absolutely phenomenal. I feel that what I received was perhaps an acknowledgement of thanks for taking time to remember people and their struggle. Or perhaps in that moment, I tapped into something far away in time and place. Either way, I'm grateful for the experience. So for anyone to really appreciate this, I have to give a little background. This happened a couple weeks ago. My alarm goes off at 5.30 in the morning on work days and I frequently wake up 30 minutes to an hour before my alarm. Often I lay there attempting to squeeze out a few extra minutes of sleep before I have to get up. On this occasion, this is exactly what I was doing. I was only half asleep. The best way I can describe it was that I was aware that I was asleep. My mind was rather blank and calm. Suddenly, I heard the sound of a doorbell. However, it wasn't the sound of my doorbell. I'm a somewhat light sleeper, so I opened my eyes wide thinking, who the hell is at my door at 5.30 in the morning? Within seconds, I realised the sound I heard was not my doorbell. I was convinced I had imagined it. Sometimes, both my girlfriend and I have auditory hallucinations in between sleep and wakefulness. For her, they're disruptive and loud. For me, they're typically not too interesting and more sedate. I thought to myself, that is what happened here. I immediately put myself at ease and tried to go back to sleep. I dozed back off for a couple minutes before finally waking up to my alarm. I then had a thought. What if what I heard was my doorbell? And because I wasn't fully awake, I misheard it. My front door has a long chime. It actually plays the Westminster chime melody. It couldn't have been that. However, I have a battery powered doorbell at my back door that only rings with one sound. Dong. This was much closer to what I thought I heard. I thought just to be safe and to make sure no one was lurking around my house at 5.30, I should check the camera. This was right outside my back door. I know from being acquainted with security cameras and how things look under infrared light, that this is not an insect and it's not a spider web. No headlights are able to shine in my backyard and this is not lens flare. I've never seen something like this on my cameras before. I definitely consider myself a believer in the paranormal, but I have a very skeptical mind when it comes to vetting what I believe is paranormal. If anyone has a theory as to a reasonable explanation, I'm all ears, but I'm happy with the explanation that this is paranormal. The fact that this corresponded with the strange doorbell sound that may or may not have been in my head has me very interested. I know that we live in a world full of skeptics who are ready to write me off as crazy. I have 32 years of unexplained experiences, entities, feelings and judgement. 
of which I have documented in multiple journals. Early in my journey, I wanted to prove skeptics wrong, but now I just want them to be open to the idea that this is not a black and white world. There is so much grey, and although sometimes it's terrifying, it can change someone's entire perspective. I want to belong to a group of like-minded individuals who see and live in the greyness of the world. There was a point in my life that I was very vocal about things I've experienced. I didn't fear people thinking I was crazy, and I was adamant about changing a skeptic's mind. In my reality, I didn't understand how or why a person could be skeptical. My first memories as a child involved an imaginary friend. It was my form of normal. Now looking back, I know the things I experienced were not normal. That I had that so-called sixth sense and was extremely sensitive to things other people were not. I've experienced things that others only experience while watching fictional horror movies. I lived in a horror movie. As I mentioned, at a very early age, I would see different entities around the house. My parents blamed it on an act of imagination, but it was real. At that time, we lived in a very old house with an additional guest house attached. We just used the guest house as storage, and we never had occupants. My father was an auctioneer and was constantly bringing home old antiques. One day, my father brought home a green recliner to go in my room for my mother to read to me at night. However, an older gentleman with a black beard and hat occupied the chair every night after my mother left. He would just sit there, appearing more as a silhouette or shadow. He never spoke and he never moved. He just sat there and watched me. I strongly believe fear is not something someone is born with, but instead comes from experiences. This figure terrified me because even as a child, I knew he was not supposed to be there and I couldn't understand why my parents couldn't see him. I wish he was the only entity in my house. There was a long hallway that separated my room from the guest bedroom and the stairs. I would always see a shadow figure walking this hallway and going into the guest bedroom. It wasn't the man in the chair. This thing was much scarier. Its energy was strong and extremely negative. The feeling that I spoke about earlier originated in this hallway. Whether it was visible or not, I always knew it was around. I would run from the stairs to my room every single day. The entity then began to move around the house. I think one of the more terrifying things that happened was when I was around 10. I was getting ready in front of a mirror hanging on the bathroom door. There was a belt on the ground next to me, partially under the door. I remember vividly looking into the mirror and seeing the belt slowly side farther under the door. Thinking I was being pranked, I opened the bathroom door and no one was there. However, the belt was now on the bathroom floor. Not only was the house leaving me in a constant state of fear and anxiety, but the guest house was a place I physically couldn't go because of the dreadful feeling it gave. The few times I did go into the guest house, I would always feel like I was going to get sick and would immediately leave. The guest house was a small house with a large attic. There was a big window in the attic that looked over the entire property. One afternoon, I was jumping on the trampoline with my friends. I believe this is the epiphany moment in my life when I realized I was not the only person experiencing these things. My friend looked up at the window with a terrified look on his face. There was a woman dressed in white looking down at us. She had long blonde hair and had a very blank expression on her face. We watched her for a few minutes and then she disappeared. The house was empty and the stairs to the attic had not been used in years. This lady didn't simply walk away from the window, she completely vanished. I had three friends that day that witnessed this entity disappearing in thin air. This was a validation to me that I was not crazy and that there are things in this world that cannot be explained. I lived in that house until I was 12 years old. The level of activity increased throughout the years to the point I began documenting them in a journal. I have specific details of each experience. When I moved to our new house, built specifically for my family, I thought things would stop and I could be a normal kid. I was wrong. So, so wrong. When I was 12, my family and I moved into a new house. The house was built specifically for us on 22 acres of land and woods in southern Indiana. 
It was a gorgeous house. Three bedroom, full basements, wraparound porch, and a catwalk that attached the two upstairs rooms and overlooked the living room. My father even had a pond dug out for the front yard, and our backyard was nothing but miles and miles of woods. I was so optimistic about moving because how could a brand new house be haunted? I encountered very bad entities that in no way can compare to my earlier encounters. Reliving some of these encounters are truly unsettling, but I think it's important. I should have followed my gut the first week we moved. I had a friend over and she helped me unpack and get settled. We stayed up all night putting my clothes away and hanging pictures on the walls. I didn't have curtains up on the windows yet and I can remember avoiding looking into the windows when it got dark because the woods had a very ominous feeling about them. Eventually, my friend and I were satisfied with our unpacking progress and fell asleep. I thought I was dreaming when we woke up the next morning. A majority of my clothes that we had hung up on there on the floor, boxes that were still full when we fell asleep were dumped over and the floor was covered with all of my belongings and trash. My parents didn't believe me or my friend, and my friend never came back to the house after that. At that moment I wasn't scared. I distinctly remember being so angry. This was my first week in my new house, and it was supposed to be a new beginning. I couldn't understand how or why this was happening again. The level of activity in this house was beyond anything I could imagine. Throughout my early teenage years, I would do everything I could to not be home. I especially never wanted to be home alone. Lights would turn off and on, doors would open, the televisions would turn on and off, the water faucets would start running, items would move to only disappear, glasses would fall off counters and break, whispers, shadows. Eventually, my family began questioning such experiences, but they would just brush it off. There were several things that were present in this house. There were so many shadow figures. The catwalk, stairs and the basements were the most common places I would see them. However, I was not the only person. The catwalk between the two rooms was basically a hallway without walls. It connected the rooms but looked down over the living room. The figures would just walk from my room to the other room, back and forth. They were nearly a full apparition but looked like a shadow. Hard to explain. One night, I had a friend over, and we were home alone watching movies. I ran to the kitchen to get a drink, and I could hear her screaming from the living room. I ran back in, and she was trembling in fear because she saw someone walk from the guest room into my room. I had already seen this thing many times throughout the years do the same thing. I tried to explain what happened to my friend, and even tried to get her to go upstairs with me to show her no one was really there. Needless to say, she ended up calling her parents and going home. On several occasions, I would be in my room watching TV with the door open and see the figure standing in the doorway of the guest bedroom. I would just shut and lock my door. This was normal, but that doesn't mean it was any less terrifying. The shadow figures in the basement were worse. Our basement didn't have a door. It was just a staircase that went into the basement from the living room. Everything that we had in storage at the old guest house was down there. However, we also had a lot of World War I and II artifacts and memorabilia. My grandfather was a collector his entire life and when he passed, our basement was the only space large enough to keep his life's work. We had medals, statues, guns, uniforms, flags, just to name a few. I 100% believe that multiple spirits were attached to these items because not only would you see shadow figures in the basement and creeping up the basement stairs, but you could hear whispers and things moving. It was truly a scene from a horror movie. Growing up, I didn't know land could be haunted. I laugh because looking back, I was living in a real life poltergeist movie. Living in the country, I played outside a lot. I often felt suffocated in the house and would just want to be able to breathe. However, I was never alone. I would often see a man standing by our pond. His face was never clear, but he would move around the pond. Sometimes he would be under our weeping willow tree, or sometimes he'd be looking down at the house. He never moved, but instead just stood there. He didn't really scare me, but I never attempted to approach him. There was also something that would walk on the porch. Many occasions I would be sitting on the porch, reading or talking with friends, and you could hear someone walking. 
It was so clear that you would fully expect to see someone walk around the corner, but instead you would see the wood move with each footstep. You would see it get closer and closer by the movement of the wood and sound, and then just stop. All of my friends and my mother witnessed this several times. It would always stop several feet in front of someone and you could hear it walking around the porch from inside the house too. There were also figures in the woods. I could look out a window at any given point and see what I would consider to be a person standing in the woods, peeking around a tree or bush. Their faces were never clear and I couldn't ever determine whether they were men or women. Interestingly enough, I was playing in the woods one day and I stumbled across an old well. It was fairly deep, but you could tell it was extremely old because what was left was barely visible. I immediately told my parents about it and showed them where it was. I guess this piqued their interest and they began researching the land more. They were able to confirm that at one time a small community occupied the land, but nothing was left except for the well. The activity never stopped or even slowed down. Even when I wasn't home, I felt like I was being watched. Still do. It impacted my family's emotional and mental states because the house was literally draining all of our energy and replacing it with negative energy. I wasn't eating. I wasn't sleeping. Everything in my life was strained because of home. I do think the house wore on my parents' relationship too. And in some crazy way, I partially blame their split on the house. In my later high school years, I started going to haunted locations with friends. For them, it was just for fun. They didn't believe my stories or the ghost stories around town. They wanted proof and thought I could help. At this point in my life, I didn't think anything could be scarier than what I lived with at home. I really began to realize how sensitive I actually was. I also learned that spirits can physically hurt you and can attach themselves to you and follow you home to your already very haunted house. Several years ago, I decided to make a stupid decision of moving in with my now ex-boyfriend. We'll call him Bob. It just seemed logical at the time instead of paying two rent payments. We were actively looking for months and he stumbled upon a house for rent in a fairly nice and convenient area of town. The owner had another person interested in the house, but he told Bob that if he came that day to look at the house and sign the lease, that it would be ours. I was at work, but I trusted him. I was young and very naive. Ugh, so stupid. And let him do it. Late that day, I met Bob at the house and did a walkthrough together for the first time. I pulled in front of the house and could not get out of my car. He was already there waiting for me on the porch. I instantly started tearing up because I knew something was terribly wrong with this house, but it was too late. We had committed to it for an entire year. The house was an older house, but just remodelled to look new. It had an odd setup. A main bedroom was in the front that was attached to the living room and kitchen. There were two extra smaller bedrooms in the back of the house attached to the laundry room. There was one bathroom that was attached to both the main bedroom and living room. It had two doors. I have a very long history with hauntings and I'm still convinced I have attachments with me at my current residence. So it wasn't surprising when unusual things began to happen. Doors slamming, lights flickering, footsteps, voices. However, I quickly found out that this entity did not want us there. Bob worked evenings, so I was usually home a majority of the time by myself. It only took a week before I saw his full apparition in the laundry room. I was cooking dinner and heard the dogs growling toward the back door. I looked over and a man was just standing there looking at me. He was very tall with dark hair. He was always wearing a red flannel shirt and had a very angry or blank expression on his face. We locked eyes and he just walked into the spare bedroom and disappeared. The longer we lived in the house, the more violent he became. The whole house would shake sometimes and we couldn't keep anything hanging on the walls. We were watching TV one night and a picture on the wall just shattered like it had been punched. Another time we were cooking dinner and we both saw a glass lift off of the counter and slam against the wall, barely missing my Bob's face. I think one of the scariest moments for me was when I was taking a bath one night. 
I was just relaxing and had the curtain closed. I saw a dark shadow on the other side of the curtain. Thinking it was my Bob, I started talking to him. My heart dropped when I heard the TV turn on the living room and heard Bob on the phone. I don't think one can describe the feeling that I had run through when I realised my ex was not the person standing on the other side of the shower curtain. It took every ounce of courage I had to jump up and pull back the curtain. I started screaming for my Bob and at the same time one of the bathroom doors slammed shut. The other was already closed. I could hear Bob trying everything he could to get to me. I was screaming, he was screaming and the dogs were barking and growling. It was absolutely terrified. The doors weren't locked but neither one of us could get them open. After about a 15 minute struggle both doors opened and everything went quiet. After that incident I begged Bob to move. He was working almost every night and I couldn't stand to be alone in the house. I felt like a prisoner and began to isolate myself to the main bedroom because that seemed to be where the least amount of activity was. One night I woke up in the middle of the night and saw the man standing in the doorway to the bedroom but he never came into the room. My relationship with Bob began to deteriorate because he didn't understand how much the entity was affecting me. I wasn't eating, I wasn't sleeping and my physical and mental health were just dropping. People laugh at me when I blame it on something supernatural but it was unhealthy for me to stay in that house. I had to leave, and I eventually did. Like my other stories, I constantly ask, why me? I had never faced off with something like this. I had encountered plenty of negative spirits before, but this was different. This felt like a physical attack. Bob was just lucky enough to also witness it. This makes me believe he wasn't an attacked spirit. Do I attract spirits? Or is it just a coincidence I moved into another haunted house? If it is a coincidence, why do I still feel like I'm never alone? It's been a little while since I've written about one of my many encounters. I had to take a hiatus because I believe stirring up these old memories has caused more activity, mild, in my life. I've been seeing shadows walking in the hallways, hearing whispers, stuff has been moving to only show up later, just odd occurrences, nothing too scary. I'm going to speak about a few small encounters, happy ones, that have happened to me throughout the years that were just a reminder that something was always with me. I first would like to talk about my uncle Steve. He wasn't a biological uncle, step grandpa's son, but we had a very close relationship I love art and drawing is my passion, and we shared that. God, he was an amazing artist. He died suddenly from a heart attack when I was a teenager, and despite him not being a blood uncle, his death broke my heart into pieces. However, I would feel him every now and then. Do you know how some people just produce a certain kind of energy? How you can feel it when you're around them? Steve had that when he was alive, and I also believe he had that after his death. There were several small incidents that just made me smile, but I want to talk about one in particular that happen happened around Christmas and was also witnessed by my grandmother, his father, my mom, and my father. It was the first Christmas after his passing and the year before, we had, he had brought my grandmother some wine, wind chimes. She didn't want the weather to damage them, so she kept them inside. We were all sitting around the Christmas tree just reminiscing about old times and Uncle Steve. Suddenly, the wind chimes in the kitchen began to make music and move. Granted, there was no wind inside the house and really no logical reason they suddenly began to move. We all smiled and joked that Steve was there with us. It was just a pleasant feeling. At this point in my life, most of my family had accepted the fact that I had an unusual connection with the supernatural. So they asked me to start talking to him. I asked, Uncle Steve, was that you? Are you here? At that moment, the lights on the Christmas tree blinked, which was unusual because they had been on the entire time. As of curiosity, they all had me ask more questions, such as if he was happy, if he watched out for us. Nothing too over the top. After every question, the lights would flicker and the wind chimes would make music. It truly was amazing. We all were in tears because you could feel he was there. I still feel Uncle Steve occasionally, and I have many of his art pieces. 
I also would like to talk about my Aunt Jean. She was such a lovely lady and passed away unexpectedly from blood clots after surgery. Her death was devastating to my family and I don't think we've ever recovered. A few months later, I got really sick, coughing up blood and I wasn't able to catch my breath. I took myself to the hospital and it was quickly determined that I had seven pulmonary embolisms. One was the size of a half dollar. And the blood was coming from my right lower lobe because I had a blockage. I was only breathing 52%. I was in pure panic. I knew I had to call my mother and my family because I was getting admitted to the ICU. After losing our Aunt Jean from the same thing, I was more concerned with their reaction than my diagnosis. As I started ringing for my mother, I had a mental image of my aunt telling me everything was going to be okay. And I instantly had a calming sense come over me. Instead of crying on the phone to my family, I told them what was going on and I was going to be okay. Everybody rushed to the hospital. I don't remember much when I was awake, but I had a dream that day. They instantly gave me pain medicine, which always puts me to sleep, of my aunt Jean. It was a dream full of bright, beautiful colours, and she was walking towards me, surrounded by flowers. She hugged me so tight and grabbed my face and told me not to be scared, that I was going to be okay. I remember the dream so vividly. There were red and blue birds flying everywhere. The sky was such a beautiful colour of blue. When she touched me, I really felt her. It felt so real and so calming. When I woke up, my mum was there. She flew up from Florida that day. My dad, my aunts and so many of my friends. They all said I was talking in my sleep and smiling. The hospital stay was about a week and I had a long recovery of Lovenox shots for six months. We discovered that the clots were due to my birth control at the time. During my recovery process, I would see tons of cardinals and bluebirds and would instantly get a feeling of relief because I knew it was my aunt just checking in on me. Two months ago, I had a pretty major surgery and I once again developed multiple pulmonary embolisms. I had another dream with Aunt Jean in it. It was just as colourful and just as calming. She told me not to give up and that this will too will pass. I was only in the hospital for four days. I caught them early. It's the same recovery. Lovenox shots for six months. However, I've seen a cardinal nearly every day since I left the hospital and I know that my Aunt Jean is watching over me every single day. Not all supernatural slash explained experiences have to be negative. I had another experience last night with a familiar friend. It occurred at my aunt's house roughly around 7 o'clock. The family has nicknamed him Old Man Flannel because he's not shy to make himself known. My aunts have been living in the house for roughly 20 years and there are dozens of stories of his apparition being seen walking in the hallway. When they first bought their house, I was roughly 10 years old and within the first few visits, I was introduced to him while exiting the bathroom in the hallway. They kept the stories about him away from me so I wouldn't be scared. But when I told them I met a man in the hallway during a family dinner, they didn't seem surprised. He's not a harmful spirit. We all think he was the man who built the house. He's very tall, wears a flannel shirt under a pair of overalls, and has scruffy, grey facial hair. He tends to stay in the hallway of the house, the original parts, peeping around corners into the bedrooms. I lived with my aunts for about a year, and I saw him several times looking into my bedroom, or just walking down the hallway to just disappear once he reached the kitchen or back door. I was over at my aunt's house last night after dinner. They had just gotten a new kitten and I was sitting in the hallway facing the kitchen, playing with the kitten. My back was towards the rest of the hallway and my aunts were in front of me talking. From behind me, one of the kitten's toy balls rolled up next to me with enough force for the bell to ring. I looked behind me to see our old friend walk into one of the bedrooms. I said a few choice words while jumping up into the kitchen and started explaining what just happened. They proceeded to tell me how the ball rolls down the hallway at night when they're in bed with the kitten. Apparently, he really likes the kitten named Sage. He's always there, and even though it never gets less creepy seeing or hearing him, old man flannel is just a part of the house everyone has learned to accept.
I recently started renting my stepbrother's family home. It's an old shotgun house, but there's plenty of room for me and my third child, Cooper. Within the first weeks of living there, I would hear the floors creak as if someone was walking through the house. Items would come up missing, only to return in new locations, and I would hear whispered conversations throughout the night in different areas of the house, all small things that didn't really bother me. One day, I was in the dining room area and heard a loud crash in the kitchen. A wine glass had fallen off the wine rack and shattered on the kitchen floor. A couple of weeks after that, my mother and boyfriend were over and another wine glass flew from the rack and shattered. We tried to debunk it because it simply could not have fallen off. It had to be lifted over the holder and thrown. Of course, all of these incidents were unsettling, but I never felt in danger. I had experienced far worse unexplained events, so I wasn't too concerned. About a couple of weeks ago, I woke up in the middle of the night around 2am to Cooper barking. Cooper sleeps with me and he's unable to jump from the bed because of its height, but he was on the edge and ready to go at whatever was there. When I came to, I could hear water running. I jumped out of bed and noticed all the lights were on in the hallway, dining room, kitchen and the bathroom. I ran to the bathroom with Cooper behind me and found that the hot water was running full blast from the bathtub and bathroom sink. It was to the rim of the bathtub and a minute later would have easily overflowed. Random items had also been thrown into the water. All my shower items, some of Cooper's toys, silverware, glasses, scissors and pens. After I turned the water off, I heard Cooper yelp from the kitchen and run off whining into the bedroom. I walked into the kitchen and the sink was also running full blast, but there was a pile of stuff in front of the locked backyard door. My laptop was on the bottom with water bottles, bread, Tupperware bowls, more of Cooper's toys, silverware and another wine glass was shattered on the floor. Frustrated and very confused, I cleaned everything up and turned around to go check on Cooper when I noticed the hallway lights were now off, but the living room lights were now on. I proceeded to walk into the living room and found another pile of stuff in front of the door. This time there was a wine glass, some books, my toothbrush, my journal and some pillows. After I had time to clean up and collect my thoughts, I suddenly had a strange sense of deja vu. For the first time in my new home, I didn't feel welcome. It took nearly an hour to get Cooper out from under the bed and the poor thing had used the restroom all over the carpet. He never does this. He was shaking and whimpering, so I just held him the rest of the night. I knew it was late, but I called my boyfriend and explained to him what had happened. He's a huge skeptic and immediately thought someone had broken into the house or that I was sleepwalking. The doors were locked and nothing was missing. No one broke in. I wasn't sleepwalking. I don't have a history of sleepwalking and I would have had to magically be able to turn the lights off and on while in another room. I hate that he didn't believe me. And I hate that in order to not seem like a crazy girlfriend, that I have to play along with the whole sleepwalking idea. Fortunately, nothing this extreme has happened again, but I'm afraid it's only a matter of time. I still hear the floors creak, items still go missing and reappear, and I still hear the whispered conversations. Cooper occasionally will start whimpering and shaking, but the only thing I can do is hold him close. I had just come home from my first summer of my freshman year of college. My parents were in the process of their divorce and both decided to vacate the house and leave me alone. I was angry, confused, and I felt abandoned by my own parents and refused to talk to either one of them. I hated being in the house alone. I never liked being there alone even when my parents were still together. Eventually, the foreclosure note appeared on the front door. My parents gave up on the house and I felt like they gave up on me. At the short notice, I knew I wasn't going to have the money, so I decided on getting an apartment with my friends. There was about a two to three week waiting list, so we just stayed in the house leading up to moving into the apartment. They knew about some of my experiences in the house and had witnessed many things just for the short amount of time they stayed there with me. Do not ever play with Ouija boards. That's what everyone always says. We didn't have the real thing, so we made one from a piece of cardboard and a little whiskey glass as the planchette. 
This was all a joke to them. They were just asking random questions and getting random responses. Nothing too scary or serious. They were laughing and making fun of the entire situation. I felt uneasy the entire time. I knew what the house was capable of, and for some odd reason, I knew it was holding back. They got bored easily and eventually stopped playing. I was somewhat relieved. We were sitting around in the kitchen when we heard scrapping on something coming from the living room. When we went to investigate, we saw the glass moving around the board by itself fairly fast. It was landing on different letters, but in a weird, repetitive way. I can still hear the sound in my head. This was clearly terrifying and wasn't what or who we were previously making contact with. We grabbed a piece of paper and spelled out the words it was making. There were seven. At this point, most people would walk away, but we were all too intrigued. The house was starting to show its true nature. We positioned ourselves around the board and placed our fingers on the glass. I asked, who or what is the seven? It spelled B-A-D and then spelled D-E-M-O-N-S. I then asked who we were speaking to and it spelled G-A-R-Y. My friends didn't know this at the time, but I knew Gary. I also knew that when he passed away, that he had requested his ashes be spread in our woods because he had always loved to hunt and hike in them. This was done in a small private ceremony and the only thing marking where it was done was a small concrete deer statue placed by a tree deep into the woods. My emotions were all over the place and in that moment I really felt as if Gary was speaking to us. The energy was insane but there was a calmness in that moment. I had tears beginning to form when I asked Gary several more questions. In the course of these questions we were able to determine that seven demons inhabited the land inside the house and on the porch. We also learned that there were good and bad spirits and that the bad trumped the good in numbers. But the good was stronger and kept me safe throughout my life. During this time, the board kind of switched gears and we also made contact with a man named Heisman. He only gave his last name. Heisman was a popular name in our town and several Heismans actually lived in the area. He had said he died in a car accident and gave us the cemetery which was in the town that he was buried in. He was apparently one of the good spirits that helped keep the bad spirits away. I was in dis disbelief and very intrigued. I was getting answered that I had been searching for since I was a child. However, one of my friends wanted more. He so desperately wanted to speak with the bad spirits and began taunting whatever or whoever was there. I urged him not to because I knew what the house was capable of. I even took my fingers off the glass because I didn't want my energy to mingle with whatever he was trying to contact. He told Gary and Heishman goodbye and said he wanted to talk to one of the bad spirits. Clearly not the smartest guy. He kept demanding a name with no response. Even after everything he had just witnessed, he wanted more proof. He had a cigarette and dared one of the spirits to roll off the board. If the spirit did this, he would give them the lighter to smoke it. Again, just taunting the house to show him more proof. But it happened. Not only did the cigarette roll off the board and onto the carpets, it rolled back onto the board. This means I had to roll up over the lump separating the board from the carpet. We all immediately jumped back. Everyone's fingers came off the glass and the energy in the house became thick. The house was alive. The lights began to flicker. The sinks began to spit water full blast. The ceiling fan cords began to swing in circles. You could hear something stomping around on the porch. Whispers were coming from every corner of the house in the basement. Doors started to slam. And the famous shadow figures from the catwalk and the basement were back. No matter how many times we apologised, it wouldn't stop. My house has five doors. One on each side and one leading out from the basement. We ran to the front door and it wouldn't open. Something was holding it closed. The only door we were able to get out of was one of the side doors, but it slammed behind us, nearly knocking my friend to the ground. Once we were outside, we could hear something running up on us on the porch. We all dove off the side stairs and into the grass. Whatever was on the porch kept running beside us while we were running for our car in the grass. I couldn't see it, but I could hear it. 
When we jumped in the car and started up the driveway, something hit the back window so hard that I could see a hand in print on the glass. We stayed at a friend's house that night, but I don't think either one of us actually slept. The events of that night were truly traumatising. Reliving now, my heart is pumping so hard because I remember feeling it all. We had to go back to the house eventually, and it was a day we all dreaded. The doors were locked, we didn't lock them, but the inside was totally trashed. There was stuff everywhere. However, the Ouija board didn't look like it had ever moved. It was in the spot where we left it, with a single cigarette laying in the middle of the board. The only thing that was different is the whiskey glass appeared to be up on top of the number seven. We quickly grabbed all of our essential items that we needed for the apartment and left the bigger items for later. I'd like to say that we never experienced anything again, but we were all convinced there was a lot of residual activity. The apartment we moved into was a somewhat new complex and there would just be a lot of odd things that would happen. I first started experiencing sleep paralysis around that time and I'd occasionally wake up in the middle of the night to a dark figure standing in my doorway. From that point on, I never felt alone. I've never gone back to the house after I moved my stuff out. I know it was foreclosed, and I believe it was sold during an auction. I've no idea who the new occupants are. They're apparently not from the area. However, I still feel such a strong connection to the house. When I visit my hometown, I feel a strong urge to go to it, just to drive past it. But I never do. It haunts my dreams often, and I'm constantly reminded of it and of the spirits associated with it. I work in a children's emergency room and have seen and heard my fair share of things. I have multiple stories, but this one always sticks out to me, but not in a scary way. Several years ago, I was working third shift, 7pm to 7am, and it had been an unfortunate evening. We had lost a child, a regular patient of the ED, earlier in my shift, and well, that's something that stays with you. However, working in this environment, you have to go on with your day. You're allowed to mourn, but for 12 hours you're there to help every child that comes through that door. Usually around 3am, the ED is able to start closing down hallways, due to the lower volumes of patients. And that night, I decided to take a much needed break, away from the noise in one of the hallways we had just closed. I was hiding away in the unit secretary area of the hallway when I heard a child's laugh and footsteps running down the hallway into a room. Again, this isn't a particularly unusual thing because we have children everywhere in the hospital. However, I wanted to investigate because there shouldn't be a child running around unattended in the closed area of the ED. I walked in the room where I heard the child and it was completely empty. Lights were still off. Behind me, I hear the same thing but in another room. But this time, the light switched on. Again, I went and investigated and it was empty. Confused, I turned the light off and went back to the desk. I sit there for a few more minutes and I see the light switch back on in one of the rooms. And shortly after, I hear the same laugh. I get up and start walking to the room, and as I get closer, I hear the same laugh and the light switches off right before I get there. At this point, I can hear my heart pounding through my chest. I knew something wasn't right. I walk into the room and turn the lights on and my heart stops. Sitting on the bed is the patient I had come to know very well throughout the years. It was the patient I had watched pass away several hours ago in our trauma room. I immediately started tearing up and I remember wanting to say something, but the words wouldn't come out. He looked at me, smiled and then laughed, and just like that it was gone. I haven't seen him since that night. Maybe I was sleep deprived and seeing things, but in that moment I felt a sense of peace. I knew he was okay. It's definitely an experience that I'll never forget, and honestly, one that I never want to forget. <laughs> 